Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to the second week of LEADS. Uh, today we're going to start our formal lecture series with Dr. Ryan Howard, known also as Ryan to me since we're co-residents. Uh, Ryan and I have started our friendship about three years ago when we both decided that it was a great idea to become surgeons here at the University of Michigan. However, he has been a fancy person since before he met me and we started this journey together. He went to medical school here in Michigan. Um, and, and during his time here, he has uh, kind of embodied a lot of the things that I like. I'm wishing upon you and all the students that we're trying to reach through leagues. Um, which is the, the path to become like a student researcher and eventual like resident researcher uh, and set up the foundation of what your academic work is going to be moving forward, whatever form, uh, shape or form that takes. Um, Ryan is interested in advancing quality of surgical care uh, and he'll be doing two years of research at the same time that I'll be doing research. Um, on like patient reported outcomes, surgical prehabilitation and clinical outcomes and costs. He has been published in about every journal that I like. Um, and he's also like, like interesting fact, he's a musician and also one of the best people I know. So <laughs> let me welcome you Ryan to our first leaks lecture. Um, and we'll start now. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much Val. Um, and it's great to meet all the leagues fellows and all the students who, who are involved. I think you guys are super, super lucky to be involved in this program. Um, if you haven't figured it out already, Val is about one of the most selfless, generous, and committed people that you're ever going to meet. Um, and she literally came up with a fellowship to help med students get ahead, um, which I think is just incredible. Um, let me put some slides up. Oh, Val, you have to enable um, screen sharing again. <laughs> Don't worry, I have plenty of slides, but hopefully they're not too boring. Um, <clears throat> so Val invited me to give a talk. I think, like she kind of said, I've published, I've done a lot of research, and I've been, you know, somewhat successful in sharing it. Okay, let's see if I can get my screen. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen, and like I said, let's get see if this works. All right, can you guys see a big slide, like my first slide? Perfect. And then I'm also going to get the chat going here so that I can see you guys if you chat anything or speak up. So. Um, like I said, Val kind of invited me to give this talk about, you know, how can we give med students the tools to get ahead? What advice can we give them? Because, you know, coming from someone I think who's, you know, published and had success in that in medical school. And um, after I agreed to talk, she sent me the name of the talk, which was Organizing Your Project, How to Read a Scientific Paper, and How to Be a Good Mentor Mentee. <laughs> which I was immediately like completely intimidated by. And I was like, wait, how long do I have to cover all of this? Um, but I got the gist of what she wanted me to talk about. And so I kind of said, you know what? A name is just a name. I think a more appropriate title would just be how to be productive, um, which I think is something that, you know, medical students often ask me with. That's certainly what I was seeking out when I was a med student was, you know, how can I be productive and you know generate things to show um, for my work in medical school? Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Like I said, speak up if you um, have questions. Type in the chat. I have the chat up so I can see everything. Um, the objectives I think of this talk are to understand the importance and advantages of being academically productive. Um, I think to kind of broadly learn how to conduct a research project from conception to publication, that could be, you know, an entire semester's worth of teaching, but I kind of try to highlight some stuff here. And then one thing I think that's really critical for medical students is knowing how and where to share the research. Because this, when I was a med student, was, you know, something that I was unaware of, and it's, I think, the most common question I get from medical students is, you know, like, how do I get it out there? Um, I've done research with Jessica, for example, and I think, you know, we've talked about just knowing which conferences to submit to. Um, I remember she was very surprised, like, wow, there's so many, like, we can just send in abstracts and get publications. Um, so with that, you know, why does productivity matter? 
I think productivity is important because your resume or your CV speaks pretty loudly about you. Um, I think everyone, you know, has, you know, stories about their background and stories about what they're interested in. Um, but, you know, to be honest, a lot of the ways the kind of advancing and um, academic medicine works is people look at your CV and they think like, okay, now I have a good idea what this person's interested in and what they want to accomplish. I think productivity matters because it's how you get people to take you seriously. One of my mentors kind of said, you know, there's almost like this threshold level um, after which, you know, let's say you've published X number of papers or you've started some initiative or something, you know, that's like the threshold to get your foot in the door. And now people are like, okay, how can I help you achieve your goals? Um, because you kind of show that you've, you've done something uh, productive. I think, you know, in a very broad sense, publication is almost like a prerequisite for impact. Um, if, you know, the whole goal is to make a change, to improve the outcomes a patient has after surgery, to help reduce opioid prescribing, you know, whatever your goal is to, you know, um, set up different programs to help, you know, students get ahead, like Val's doing, um, really getting it out there and sharing it in an academic sense is kind of like, you know, a way that you, you broaden that um, impact that you're going to have. Um, being productive gets you funding. Um, you can get grants, you can, you know, publish and you can take the ideas that you, you know, really are interested in and get money to fund those and, you know, get um, money to really um, help you accomplish, you know, future research projects and, and carry those along. And a lot of those grants and a lot of funding really relies on kind of having shown that you have a track record of success. You get to travel, um, you present at conferences, you um, get you know, invited to speak, um, which I think is a really integral part of being an academic surgeon um, because the point is kind of to get your ideas out there. And it makes you competitive um, for residency, which you know, is something that in just a few years, uh, you guys will be thinking about and applying for. So this is from the match from 2018. And this is just the number of publications, abstracts, and presentations that applicants had um, uh, when they applied to residency. So almost everyone had at least one or more publication or abstract or presentation. 50% um, had more than five or more. And so I think, you know, it's just, it's good to kind of take stock of what is the playing field and, you know, who, who are you competing against and to realize it's good to kind of build your CV because then you just have much more leeway in terms of where do I want to go? What kind of practice do I see myself, you know, taking up? Um, it just gives you more flexibility. And so, so there's a question, does it matter if it's surgery or non-surgery publications? Um, you know, to be quite honest, I don't think that's super important. Um, uh, having publications that are not surgical related still shows you know how to see a project to completion and still shows you know how to publish something and shows that you're committed to sharing um, data with the world. Um, and so I, you know, so here's an interesting story about that. Um, before, the year before I went to med school, I got a job as a research assistant in a sleep laboratory in Detroit. So we did like sleep studies. We um, studied a lot of night shift workers and looked at a bunch of different sleep disorders. I published a few papers about sleep disorders. This is years before I had any notion I wanted to go into surgery. And on the residency interview trail, I think I got asked about those papers more than anything I wrote about like, oh, you know, blood clots after surgery or opioids or whatever. Because you had all these surgeons who were like, oh, really? So like, should I be getting more sleep? Um, like, are there ways I can, you know, make my sleep hygiene better, et cetera? So, yeah, I think if you just show that you're um, committed to seeing projects through to completion, it really speaks um, for itself. Jessica asked a good question about the importance of authorship order. Um, I think as medical students, and I'll kind of get to this later, you guys really have the opportunity to position yourselves to be first authors on paper on papers um, and presentations because you guys are the ones who have the time to do the project and write the paper. Um, I just did a project with Jessica where I'm like a resident working 80 hours a week. And so she was the one who collected the data, did patient interviews, wrote the manuscript, and I helped her along the way and I helped guide her, you know, where we should send the paper and where we should send the abstract. But she was the first author because she did all the work. And so one thing I always emphasize with students is you guys have tons of time. Um, and so really take advantage of that. 
So along the lines of, you know, how do you be productive? I think there's kind of, I'm going to break the talk into two parts. The first is it's important to actively conduct clinical research. And we're going to talk about how do I do that? But the second part that's equally important is how do I share my research with the world? Um, so I'm going to talk first about the actively conducting clinical research. Priscilla asked the question, do publications before med school count as much? Um, <clears throat> I think you know they're still important, but I think publications you do, do during med school can count more, especially if you're able to align those with your interests um, and show that you know I'm taking active steps. Okay, I want to be a surgeon. I just presented a paper about surgical outcomes. Uh, we're working on the manuscript, et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay, great. All right, so, um, and maybe what we'll do is I'll take a break every, I don't know, 15 minutes or so and try to do the questions and we'll, we'll group them. So the first part, actively conducting clinical research. So I think, you know, the things I wanna talk about are finding a research project, my kind of tips for doing research in medical school, actually doing the project, and then an example from med student Ryan, um, just to kind of give you guys an idea of, you know, one that kind of went from conception to publication. Um, so the first thing is like, how do I come up with a project? I think this is something a lot of students struggle with because you see some really cool lab and you think, oh, I want to work in that lab, but they don't need anyone right now. You see someone who's just banging out a ton of publications, but they don't have time, you know, maybe to work with a student. But I think as a student, there are so many ways that you can come up with a unique project where you're really the leader and the, you know, kind of conceiver of that project. So the first thing I always, which was advice to me, which I always give advice to students, is, you know, what makes you mad? Think of things that just get you upset. So maybe you think like, oh my God, I can't believe healthcare is so expensive. You know, that is something that Karin Chabra and Kyle Sheets think about a lot. Um, Karin is a surgery resident at the Brigham, and Kyle's a chief resident now here. And they transformed essentially what was, you know, this thought of why is this so expensive into a study looking at surprise billing after elective surgery. Um, and it totally blew up and was published in JAMA and, you know, they were on the news. Um, and I think Karin even got asked to work with an insurance company on this. So, um, you know, that's kind of an example of transition, transforming, you know, this idea into, you know, some kind of product. You know, maybe you think, as in my case, I can't believe patients are getting addicted to opioids. Like it blew my mind when I first learned that after something like varicose vein removal, which is like a 20 minute outpatient procedure, like six to 10% of patients will be addicted to opioids after that. Um, that just totally shocked me. And so we turned that into a lot of work looking at how do we prescribe opioids after surgery and is that the culprit in getting patients hooked on opioids? The other thing is, what do you see in your everyday life? I think if you think with kind of a research-oriented mind, um, you'll actually be overwhelmed with things that you want to study. Um, so for example, maybe you're like, why did my friend change their mind about going into surgery? Like just common stuff that you might never think is like the substance of a research project. Turns out that's something that's heavily stu studied is like factors that influence med student decision making, reasons people love surgery rotations, reason people hate surgery rotations. I mean, like there's, and this stuff is um, great for med student projects because so much of it just relies on surveying your peers and talking with faculty. Um, so I think these are really simple down to earth, you know, ideas, but that can have pretty profound impact. Maybe another thing is <clears throat> you're in clinic with a faculty and you're like, oh, that's so interesting. We saw a patient with a hernia and I know that hernia surgery is pretty straightforward. Why did the attending say they're too sick? Like, why, why couldn't the patient get surgery? Turns out there is a whole field of studying how to get patients well for surgery so that they can um, uh, tolerate the, you know, insult of surgery and recover without any major complications. Um, a big thing you can do is kind of deconstruct your interests. And I kind of think of this as like deconstructing your interview self. So, you know, you go into an interview and maybe you think like, you know, I'm interested in making surgery safer. Um, and that's great. And I think that those are the kind of big ideas we're all passionate about. But deconstruct what that means. Maybe, you know, to look at making surgery safer, 
you have to look at, you know, well, what is even associated with a complication after a hernia repair or heart surgery or bariatric surgery? That's the stuff you could get at pretty easily doing a chart review, just looking up patients who got those surgeries and seeing, oh, this one had a heart attack. This one got admitted to the emergency department. Maybe you think like, do patients in Michigan have better outcomes than patients in Ohio? Um, are the outcomes in different places different? And what do we have to learn from that? Or does physical activity before surgery help patients recover better? And so I think if you can kind of deconstruct your broad interests, you can come up with a lot of research questions. Maybe you're someone who thinks like, well, I'm interested in public health. There's so much opportunity in surgery for that. You know, when I tell a patient to quit smoking, do they actually do it? Are there ways I can ensure that they do it? Can we enroll patients in an exercise program at the time of surgery, get them healthier, and hopefully take those habits even out once they're done with their surgery? Um, does a patient's local air pollution level affect their surgical outcomes? There's really no shortage of things you can kind of find to research once you start, I think, deconstructing your, your broad interests or what kind of you know, surgeon or academic surgeon you want to be. And then I think you know, it's always fine to ask a mentor, but I think the keys here is you know, come with some ideas. I, I think the thing you maybe want to avoid is going to a mentor and saying like, hey, I, I want to do research. I hear it's important to get published. Um, you may have luck with that. People may give you projects, but I think if you really want to own a project and start kind of crafting the trajectory of, you know, what kind of academic surgeon you want to be, it's good to come with ideas. Um, you know, it helps if, let's say, you're interested in, um, I don't know, outcomes after bariatric surgery. You talk to a bariatric surgeon, obviously aligning your um, research questions or ideas with their area of expertise helps. And then I think you also want to be clear about your goals. Um, you know, a lot of faculty are very busy. And I think from meeting number one, setting a goal that says like, you know, I, I want to present this at X conference, or I really hope this ends up on my resume for ERAS. Um, you know, it happened to me and it happens to tons of people. You get involved in research and it's not done by the time you apply. And so you're like, wow, I did all this work and it's not on my application for residency. Um, so I think being clear about goals and timeline is really, really important. Um, the big picture of all that, I honestly think any time that you find yourself confused, frustrated, curious, honestly thinking just like, wow, like there is totally a better way to do this. There's a giant research project there just waiting to happen. There's probably five different research projects, but you know, there's certainly at least one um, I think that you could, you could um, tackle as a student. And then, you know, there's a few things I always kind of tell students about doing research in medical school, because I think there's, you have a lot of unique opportunity as a student um, uh, in getting stuff done. Um, and I don't know, Jessica can maybe weigh in and, you know, um, uh, kind of say if she's experienced, you know, kind of the things I'm talking about here. The first is, you know, I think it's good to set out with a practical scope. Um, again, I think as a student, you're going to start encountering, um, you know, some like research rock stars who are just doing, you know, massive Medicare database um, analyses and, you know, these giant projects that have, you know, huge implications. And th those are great. And you may get to participate in some of those, but those really rely on this huge team. You may be emailing with an analyst to get the analysis done for seven or eight months before you have any data. Um, and that, that kind of stuff, I think, slows you down. And so I think as a student thinking like, you know what, I'm going to survey all the other students about why they are intimidated by surgery or something. Um, you know what, I'm going to look at how many patients at our outpatient surgery center got readmitted versus patients at our, uh, you know, main hospital. Um, you know, in my case, I'm going to just see how many pills people took after surgery. Um, I think you want to try to think of projects that have a straightforward analysis. Um, really good advice I've gotten and, you know, I think is spot on is, you know, a good research project is one you can explain to your mom. Um, there's a lot of very lofty research that takes place and it's very important, certainly in setting like, you know, national policy that uses very complex statistical methodology, et cetera. Um, but if you can just say like, hey, it turns out we were prescribing too many opioids, we should probably cut back. Um, everyone understands that. And I think the more understandable um, your research project is, the more impact you can have, to, to be perfectly honest, because now it's accessible to everybody, not just people who are familiar with certain research methods. 
<clears throat> I think it's good to be self-sufficient as a student. And what I mean by that is, you know, you guys are going to have research electives. You're going to have time in between class. You're going to have time in between rotations. You're going to have the time to say, collect the data, write the paper, do the analysis, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that, because like I said before, you know, you don't want to end up in a position where you're maybe waiting on an analyst for what can turn into months and sometimes years just to get data. Um, you know, the more self-sufficient you are, I think the more you can just kind of get the work done, uh, which is really important as a student. Um, I think it's important to think of projects where your time now becomes an asset. I remember as a student thinking like, you know, why would someone work with me? Why, what do I have to author, offer? I don't really know how to do statistics. I don't know much, you know, you know I'm still a, a learner kind of, you know, very at the very beginning level. But as a student, like you have the time to do the chart review. You have the time to call the patients and say, you know, how many pills did you take after your surgery? Or um, were you satisfied with your surgery? Or, you know, talk to your peers and say, hey, I'm doing this big survey. Do you guys, would you be, participate? Um, I think if you can think of projects where the methodology suddenly puts you in the center of being the person who is really running the show, um, that can be really powerful. And then just to kind of echo that, I think there is a lot of value in doing most of the study yourself. Um, you know, I'm certainly not saying don't be a team player, um, but I think if you can do the chart review, if you can write, you know, at least the abstract, if you can do some simple stats, you know, now the ball's in your court, you can get it done as fast or as slow as you want to. Um, and the other thing that's really beneficial here is you really get a much more in-depth understanding about the findings. If you, you know, partner with an analyst and they send you a bunch of p-values, it can be very hard to figure out what, is, what do these mean. Um, when we were interviewing patients about how many opioids they took after surgery and we found they weren't taking enough, you know, that has all kinds of different implications. It could mean that, you know, we're prescribing too much and patients don't need them. It could mean we're prescribing the wrong opioids. It could mean that maybe patients are afraid of, you know, there's a million things you could kind of parse out of that. But because we kind of had a small group doing the interviews and doing the analysis and really doing each critical part of the study, we really got a better understanding of the reason behind uh, the findings. Um, what do you think, Jessica? Is that kind of broadly reflect what you've experienced? Yeah, I think definitely. I think, um, so I've been really lucky because I've worked both with Ryan and Valeria for research. Um, so I think all those things really apply. Um, and I think really, like you're saying, find things that you're passionate about and then trying to balance that with people who are doing projects that are feasible. Because I think sometimes um, there's also stuff you could be really interested in, but it could take years to kind of accomplish that. And that's one thing that's hard in medical school. Um, and I think the stuff that might take just one or two years is really nice um, for you to be involved, especially when you're passionate about it. But the stuff that might I know some projects even take um, like Bartlett's lab like decades like it's like you know it's ex exciting stuff but it takes a really long time and then I think also knowing your skills um, and how you can like use them but also stuff you want to learn is important and I think Kelly's had a little bit he's now got involved in like research he's enjoyed but he's earlier had some of the experience where um, had to rely on other people or in labs. That yeah, was... definitely, definitely the comment about trying to find something that um, you know you're going to be able to get your hands on the data in a reasonable time frame is, is super important. I encountered several projects early on in medical school where it was kind of like, oh, you have a math background, you can do this super cool analysis for us, it'll be amazing, it'll be great. But then the data itself just wasn't there and there, there was no practical way to access it. And so it, it really burned a lot of time. And, you know, you do have you do have more free time in medical school, but it still has kind of like uh, yeah. caps, caps on it, right? So you, you, you maybe you have a bunch of free time this month, but if you don't get your data that month, it's not gonna be very productive. So, so that's, I think, a very important component that I, <laughs> I experienced as well. Yeah, I think in a perfect world, like you're saying, Ryan, is that you get a project done that you're passionate about and you can really be involved with. And then before the EROS deadline, which for us this year, they pushed it back because of COVID, but normally it's um, September 15th is the, is the deadline that you try to 
get as much of your work done that can go on your CV? Yeah, it'll be um, September 15th of your fourth year in medical school. That's the deadline for grass. And so, yeah, what, you know, the more you can put on there, the better positioned you are. Um, so maybe now, so that was one of the questions Robert asked. Any other questions kind of so far about anything I've said? I, I hope I'm not just barely Shen, through a bunch um, of in. So, so if you're spearheading your own project, um, how do you find someone to like be the senior author or, or um, like how do you find, or do you, do you even need someone in that case, um, I guess to kind of um, yeah, that's that's a really good question. I, I think, you know, ideally you would kind of from the get-go be talking to some faculty or maybe someone who's a, in a mentorship position for you just to let them know this is kind of what I'm interested in and what I'm planning on doing. So, you know, for me, transplant surgeon named Mike Anglesby, um, who's been my mentor for, for years, and even now um, when I think, hey, you know, I'd like to, you know, work on this, I go to him just to kind of you know, get his thoughts on it, because usually he has just, you know, incredibly brilliant feedback before I even get started. But also just so that now he's kind of in the loop that I'm going to be, you know, doing this project. Um, so I, I think it is good. That's a really good point, Priscilla. I think it's good, you know, even when you're like kind of, you found the self-sufficient project, at least keeping tabs with a faculty who serves as a mentor for you. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I like to emphasize, if you kind of follow, you know, the, the, these ideas about, you know, making it practical, making it a reasonable scope, et cetera, I think the benefit that Jessica and Kelly kind of hinted at <clears throat> is, is that if you do all that, you can really start any time. Um, one of the things I realized talking to peers or talking to med students now is, um, you know, they think like, well, I'm taking a stats class next summer and then I'll start. Or, you know, we're waiting on some funding to come through or et cetera. And to be honest, my number one um, resource for research during med school was Google. <laughs> was just figuring out like, okay, I've got two groups. How do I compare them statistically? You know, how do I put together a convincing paper? You know, what questions do I have about health policy? And so, um, you know, again, I think really kind of, making it something where you can kind of um, uh, take front and center on, on actually getting the work done uh, means that you can kind of start at any time. And again, in this case, um, like Priscilla even suggested, a mentor is great here if you do courses. So maybe you um, reach a point with the data and you're not sure where to go. A mentor can be someone who sets you up with maybe someone to help clarify the statistics. Or maybe a mentor says, you know, there's this great, um, you know, public health professor in the School of Public Health. Why don't you guys have a meeting? Because he'll really, um, you know, what you're working on. And so I think a mentor's knowledge of experts in the field can be really invaluable because they can really set you up um, with them. <clears throat> so those are some th thoughts on, you know, like picking a project, coming up with something and setting a scope. Then it comes time to like actually do your project. Um, I don't have, you know, like any great answers here, but just kind of in, you know, because it is something at the end of the day, you're just kind of doing the work. Um, <clears throat> but my, my broad thoughts are really, so you have your idea, um, you know, let's say you, you know, let's say you want to look at um, uh, reasons people change their mind, they come into med school wanting to do surgery, and then they decide not to, you, you know, you're curious about so the next thing you have to do is figure out what kind of data you need to collect to answer that question. And so I would just, you know, sit down and write, okay, I probably need surveys. Um, I probably need to collect some demographic data about my fellow students. Um, I could just get that by asking them, what surveys do I want to ask? If you're doing a big chart review, then you need, you know, patient's age, patient's sex, um, their outcome, the surgery they had, et cetera. Um, you will, has anyone had experience working with an IRB or getting an IRB approval? So the IRB, anytime you do any kind of research, it basically has to get approved by um, an oversight body called the Institution Review Board. Every university has one to ensure that it's ethical research. Um, you know, it's not something that's going to take advantage of the subjects or that's going to cause harm certainly to anybody. Um, so most 
research projects, you apply for IRB approval. Um, this can be a really intimidating uh, task as a student because it feels like a whole other project in and of itself. But my main advice here is just keep it brief, maybe just a paragraph. Um, some people write like giant dissertations in their IRB application. Um, but I think, you know, we, um, for example, when we were doing the work with opioid prescribing after surgery, we said, there's a huge opioid epidemic in the United States. We think, you know, prescribing after surgery may play a role. Our plan is to find out how many pills patients are getting prescribed, if it's excessive, and what's it. Um, it was a uh, you know, few sentences. So I think you know, if you do need an IRB, my advice would just be to keep it brief. If there's more specific questions about that, we can certainly, um, certainly talk about that. Um, I think it's really good to make a schedule um, to literally say, okay, I'm gonna spend an hour on Friday doing chart review. Because chart review can be so tedious and you wanna give up, you feel like you've been working at it for 10 hours and it's been like five minutes. Um, so you know, set yourself on a timer for an hour and just pull data. Maybe say, okay, I want to spend an hour working on the introduction to my paper, or I want to spend, you know, 30 minutes, you know, figuring out the final details of my abstract. I think making a schedule is really, really helpful. And then I think something that students might not realize is it's totally fine to write as you go. Um, a lot of, I, I think people wait until they have all the data and they've got all the analysis and they've got all the conclude the paper. But you can write a science, you can write the majority of a scientific article, even kind of without any results yet, or even any data yet. You know, the introduction to our theoretical paper about um, why people change their mind about surgery, you know, you could say, um, you know, currently there's growing need, you know, for, um, you know, surgeons in America. Um, many students come into medical school thinking they want to do something procedural but some change their mind. This adds to, you know, the shortage of, you know, proceduralists, et cetera. You could come up with something based on a lit review that you do. And so there's a ton of stuff you can write um, kind of as you're doing the research. And I think as you collect data, that'll kind of inform what you write. <clears throat> and then I think it's really important to make use of a mentor as you go. Um, and along those lines, I think key to being a good mentee, um, I think of a story of kind of one of the first um, mentors I had in surgery, which was this um, phenomenal vascular surgeon here named Don Coleman. And we worked on a, a relatively small project. It was 13 patients, and it was just it was looking at the um, outcomes of something called an aortoduodenal fistula, which is a really bad surgical problem, rare, so we had very few patients. Um, and at our first meeting, she said, Ryan, every time I, we meet, I want you to have something for me. And what she meant was that when I was getting 30 minutes of her time or an hour, that was a huge opportunity for me. So I could use that time to ask questions. I could use that time to show her new data and help her guide me, you know, what should we do with it? I could use that time to say, hey, I, I came up with a draft of our introduction can you go over it with me? Um, you know, what she meant wasn't like, hey, you got to deliver every time. It just meant that you should make use of every meeting. Try not to just have a meeting where you show up and it's like, hey, we just, you know, touch and base. Um, I, I think if you kind of have an objective every time you go into a meeting with any mentor, it can be really powerful. Um, so an example of kind of a research project I did, um, just to kind of put all this stuff in context, so, you know, I, I had my idea, and in working with Dr. Anglesby, we had this idea of we should study the opiate epidemic. Here's a really big problem, and no one can be faulted for trying to address this. But, you know, you have to refine that, and you have to be like, well, let's study opioid prescribing, because it's too vague to kind of say, you know, the opiate epidemic, what would we be looking at? And even with opioid prescribing, are you talking about chronic prescribing? Are you talking about the pills people are on when they come in for their surgery, what they get after. And so we narrowed it even more. We said, let's study opioid prescribing after surgery. But that's pretty vague too, because there's a ton of different surgeries from you know, something as simple as getting a mole removed to open heart surgery. Um, and so you might have a ton of different results and it's hard to compare them to each other. And so we said, okay, let's study opioid prescribing after one surgery, um, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy or getting your gallbladder removed. And even then, there's practice variation. If you're at the big university hospital 
or the small community hospital or an outpatient center or someone who has acute cholecystitis and needs you know, an urgent surgery versus someone who electively is getting their gallbladder removed. So we said, okay, okay, let's study opioid prescribing after one surgery at one location, which was our East Ann Arbor Medical Center, which is an outpatient surgery center. People are just getting elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And so, you know, again, it kind of got narrowed from this big picture of, you know, the opioid epidemic, here's something we're mad about. Here's something we want to understand and improve to how can we deconstruct that and actually look at one specific thing that we could generate data for and write up results. And so the first thing we did <clears throat> was we said, well, how much do we prescribe? And we did a simple chart review of 170 surgeries. And we found that the medium prescription size was about 50 pills. Um, that in and of itself could, was, was a perfectly fine research study because this, this was kind of novel information at the time. It was the practice at one institution about how much they prescribe. But we took it a step further and we said, well, I wonder how many end up being left over. Like how many do people actually take? Because if people are taking 50 pills, then we're doing a fine job prescribing. And so next we did phone surveys. I, I literally just used my cell phone and started calling patients um, and asked them, hey, it looks like you had your gallbladder removed six months ago. How many pills did you take? Um, and it was fascinating. Patients loved talking. They were like, oh my God, you know, I only needed one pill. My doctor gave me way too many. I can't, you know, this stuff is on TV. Everyone had something really interesting to say about the opioid epidemic. And so for me, this was a really interesting lesson in doing the work myself, doing the survey myself. I got so much insight into patients' perceptions of pain control and opioid prescribing versus if someone else had collected all the data and sent me an Excel spreadsheet that said, hey, here's how many pills you know, patients one through 100 use. Um, so clearly, in this case, there's a huge discrepancy between sending a patient home with 50 pills and they're using five or six. So the next thing we did was we came up with guidelines to say, all right, based on our survey data, we could probably prescribe maybe 10 or 15 pills and patients would be just fine. And we would be keeping tons of pills in the community. And so we did that and we shared it with the, basically the entire surgical faculty and all the residents and everybody. And we studied the effects of that. And the next 200 patients who underwent that surgery, they all got 15 pills. There was no increase uh, in refills that patients needed. We surveyed their pain scores, which were the same. We surveyed their satisfaction, which was the same. And so we had kind of successfully kept thousands of excess pills out of the community without making patients any worse off. Um, <clears throat> and that was it. It was me doing a chart review, you know, calling some patients. Um, and now actually through a rather large team. This has been upscaled to tons of surgeries in dozens of hospitals all over the state. Um, you know, but I think what was telling, I think, was as a student, you kind of had the tools at your disposal to, to do the basic analysis well, of, you know, doing a research project. And that's kind of the, you know, how do I actively conduct the research part of, of the presentation the next thing <clears throat> that I think is important is knowing how to share your research. Um, and so next I wanna talk about kind of knowing where to submit stuff. How do I write an abstract? How do I present stuff at a conference? And how do I write you know, a paper to get published? Before I start, it looks like Gabriel asked, do you believe there is a significant difference in time consumption, whether we do retrospective study versus a study that we would need to collect our own data? So, you know, a retrospective, say, comparison study is a great med student study because it is fairly quick. You can just get data that is already out there. Um, surveys take time. Um, Jessica and I know that very well. Surveys can take a lot of time. And it can be very valuable data, and it's prospective. Um, but retrospective studies still get published. And especially in fields, or I should say topics, where we don't know a lot about that topic, a retrospective study is a great place to start. And you can always end your paper saying, this is our first step. Next up, we plan to do a prospective study. And next up, we plan to do a randomized trial, et cetera. So I do think that <clears throat> doing a retrospective study is a little quicker um, when you're doing something uh, as a student. So in the interest of time, I'll keep going. And you know, if you guys want to talk about this more later, you have questions, we can certainly connect. So one thing I think that is critical for students is knowing where to submit stuff. This is um, 
the thing that really blew my mind as a student, seeing how many opportunities there are. And I think <clears throat> it's kids, you know, who have a CV with a bunch of papers when they're applying to residency. And then students who have a lot of interests, which are equally valid and they're obviously equally passionate about stuff, but they just haven't quite tr translated that <clears throat> into presentations or publications, which is an important metric, you know, for what it's worth. And so this is an example of how many opportunities just in the coming year, based on your interests, there are to submit abstracts and go present research. <clears throat> Any subspecialty you can think of has a national conference. Um, there are conferences that are geared towards education, that are geared towards surgical subspecialties. There are conferences that are geared towards outcomes, where all you want to talk about is, you know, how many patients uh, died after surgery and how can we make surgery safer. There are conferences that are geared towards qualitative research, where you're actually talking more about patient interviews, what was the patient experience like. Um, there are tons of opportunities, and <clears throat> all these conferences have websites and they publish their deadlines. Two conferences I will highlight in particular is the Academic Surgical Congress, which is a national conference where med students have tons of success submitting stuff. Um, they, they, I think, have like a 90 or 90 percent acceptance rate. It was the first conference I went to. It was awesome. It would totally just open my eyes to, you know, what was possible. Um, Moses Gunn Research Conference is a U of M Department of Surgery conference. Um, I realize you guys aren't students at U of M, um, but some people do travel for this conference. And again, it's really geared towards medical students and even resident research. Um, it's a great conference. All these other conferences still though are things you can, um, case in point, I just added this slide this morning the Academic Surgical Congress just today, I think, maybe yesterday, um, just announced its deadline um, for abstracts. So it's a month from tomorrow, um, which may seem soon, <clears throat> but again, if you have some data or you've started something, you know, I, I talked to a lot of students who are working on something, but then it didn't really kind of um, occur to them like, well, great, you're working on it. Let's write up what you have so far and submit it to a conference. Um, so again, this stuff, is going on all the time. There's no shortage of opportunities to submit abstracts to. Um, <clears throat> on writing it, and I hope this isn't too kind of basic. Obviously, stop me if you, you guys probably know a lot of this, but I think it's good at least to revisit and I'll offer some of my thoughts. So <clears throat> the abstract is kind of the first thing you produce out of a project. And that's what you maybe send to a conference. You say, turns out we found that we prescribed too many opioids. We're gonna write that up and send it to a conference. It's usually pretty short, and it usually just has four sections, the intro, the methods, the results, and the conclusion. The intro is really easy. What's the background and what's the knowledge gap? So you're raging opioid epidemic in the United States, surgery, uh, many patients are prescribed opioids after surgery. However, it's currently unknown if those prescriptions are excessive. Um, so we wanted to look at opioid prescribing after surgery. I mean, you could pick any topic and within a couple minutes you can think of, well, what's the larger context and what's the knowledge gap that my question, my study is gonna answer. The methods is straightforward. You know, we did a retrospective study um, looking at opioid prescribing after surgery. We did a retrospective survey of students after their third year surgery clerkship, et cetera. Um, what outcomes did you look at? Um, our primary outcome was satisfaction with the surgery clerkship, our pri et cetera. And then you usually have a sentence about your statistics, which again, <clears throat> they don't have to be crazy fancy. We conducted a t-test to compare you know, A versus B. Um, some, sometimes too, you can do a study where there isn't even really any stats involved. It's really study. Um, when we did um, the opioid stuff, we didn't do a lot of stats. We literally just said, let's describe how many we're prescribing and let's describe how many patients use. That, that was about it. So you can really tell a compelling story and achieve impact even when there's not a lot of very, um, you know, high level statistics going on, maybe even more so. Uh, um, results is really straightforward. You know, what was the study, you know, over two years, X number of patients underwent X surgery. We found that 
this percentage was satisfied, et cetera. Um, results is pretty straightforward. I think for an abstract, the money is really in the intro because you're kind of setting up the hook of, you know, why does this study matter? And then the conclusion, you know, the kind of the formula for the conclusion is you restate your findings. And here is kind of where you're allowed to make some kind of implication or forward looking statement about it. So, you know, we found that opioids were widely overprescribed after surgery. This suggests that drastically reducing prescribing will likely not cause patients any harm and will keep the communities safer. You know, some kind of forward looking thing. Um, those are kind of the basic tenets of an abstract. Um, <clears throat> these are great because you can come up with an abstract on projects you're in the middle of, on projects that might not have enough substance to be a paper, and you can send it in and it goes on your CV. And if you get invited to present, I mean, now you get to go to Las Vegas or Boston or you know wherever the conference is and go present. And to a large extent, med medical schools want to support students doing this stuff because it's great for students, it's great for the school, and medical schools will find ways to fund your trip. Um, and so it's great just to get to go to a conference and see that world. So, <clears throat> and, and again, just to give an example of, you know, not to be overwhelmed with the abstract, I've written ab abstracts like in the before the submission deadline. Um, they can be very straightforward. I'm not saying that's like a great practice, but just, you know, ab and Jessica and I have worked on abstracts um, for projects together. They can be stuff that, that you, you're, you're kind of like, wow, it's done already? Great because um, it's just kind of telling one story. So you submit your abstract, and the you get an email, it's like, this is great, we want you to come present your work. <clears throat> so the presentation, every conference has a different format, but it's usually short. Some conferences do these quick shot presentations where your presentation is three minutes with a two minute and answer session. Along those lines, you will all always try to content in your presentation when you start making it. You will always put too much content in your presentation. This, this is something I stress a lot because you've done all these interviews, you've done this chart review, et cetera, and you wanna get it all in there. You worked on it, you wanna show your work, um, but three minutes is a short time. I mean, I can barely get through like the background of the opioid epidemic in 10 minutes. Um, so you're trying to get through a whole study. And so I think keep it really simple. Highlight a couple of your major findings when you're going to present, and that's what people will remember. Um, the, the presentations that I think people walk away maybe confused are where someone's rushing through a bunch of information. Um, hopefully not the case with this presentation, although I've tried to put a lot in here. Um, but three minutes is a short time. Uh, um, <clears throat> a piece of advice that I do, I write a script. I write a word-for-word -word script of everything I'm going to say. And then I read that script. And if it's four minutes long, I cut stuff out. And if it's three and a half minutes long, I cut more out. And I just keep reading that script. Because if all you've got is three minutes, you can't waste, you know, a second to kind of tell the story. And the smoother it is, and the more coherent it is, the more people are going to remember. Um, some of the best presentations I've seen, it's like someone's just getting up and like telling like an NPR story. You're just like, oh my god, that is fascinating. And you know some of the ones that I think where people are trying to cram stuff in or going through tons of graphs that I can't see from the back of the room, it's hard to kind of walk away remembering as much. Um, and then obviously practice. You should practice a ton. Um, practice with your friends, practice with faculty. Um, I once gave a presentation to the guy sitting next to me on a plane uh, to the conference because he was like, a, I think he was a medical consultant and he saw me working on it. He was like, hey, what's that? And I just gave a presentation. So just keep practicing. And by the time you give it, it should just be automatic um, and people will love it. And then you gave your presentation. Now it's time to write your paper. <clears throat> now, writing an academic surgery paper, again, could be like a week's worth of lectures. So this is going to be the utmost basics. And there are other resources for this that I'm happy to share with people. But just in the interest of really breaking it down, a paper has a typical structure. There's an introduction, methods, results. The thing in a paper that's not in an abstract is a discussion section. So this is where you kind of wax philosophical about your findings and you get to talk about your findings and why they're important. Um, like I said before, you can start writing at any time, even before you have any data. 
And I think, you know, again, there's really not enough time to get into all this stuff, but keep a library of citations that you're going to use as you go. Um, it's, it makes writing the paper a lot easier as you're doing the study. Just, just keep, you know, papers you find, things that people bring to your attention. So some general thoughts on writing a paper. I think it's really important to tell a narrative, to tell something that flows. Um, if it's just this <clears throat> smattering of data and you're just, here's all the stuff we found, I don't think it's gonna have as much impact as if you can kind of tell this logical story that flows and says, you know, we started with this problem. You know, what a problem it is. It's just, it affects all these people, et cetera we realized that studying this one thing might give us some insight into that problem. When we studied it, we found this. Because we found that, we think we're a step closer to addressing this big problem. You know, I think if you can make a logical narrative, um, people are gonna remember it. <clears throat> Something I always like to emphasize is you don't need to squeeze everything in. Um, when we started doing the opioid work, we had data on Tylenol pills, Motrin, uh, pain score at the surgical site. We collected all this stuff because you never know what's going to shake out. And we decided not to include all of that in kind of the main first paper. We would detract from the main message, which was that people get too many pills, period. Um, so I would, you know, implore uh, you guys as you start writing academic papers, be more concerned kind of on the clarity of the study than squeezing it in every last of the study. And then what I think is an incredible piece of advice a um, uh, uh, surgeon, transplant surgeon named Dori Segev gives in a talk uh, is think from the trenches and publish for the policymakers. You guys are going to be in clinics, you're going to be in the hospital, you're going to know how to collect data, what kind of data is important, etc. But when you're telling the story, not everyone's important, um, I don't know, that patients are having blood clots, you know, in the ICU you with their central nerve. So I think this is just another way of kind of saying when you turn it into a paper, um, try to tell it in a way that kind of the broad public is going to understand it. Um, or at least it's, it's, you know, understandable. Obviously, you're writing for other surgeons and other scientists. But I think if you can make something compelling that's digestible, it'll have that much more impact. Um, you know, because we're running out of time, I'll highlight two sections in the paper because I think methods is pretty straightforward. You just tell what you did. Results is pretty straightforward. You just present your results. And we already talked about the conclusion. So I'm just going to talk about the introduction and the discussion really briefly in the Q&A. So the introduction is typically three paragraphs. Why is my topic important? What is the knowledge gap? And how does my study address the knowledge gap? So paragraph one, America's in the midst of an opioid epidemic. This is my example. Um, surgery may contribute to that. Paragraph two, we actually don't really know surgery contributes to the opioid epidemic. We don't know what prescribing is like after surgery. Paragraph three, therefore, we decided to survey patients about opioid use and prescription size after surgery. You can apply that to kind of any topic, and that sets up a very compelling introduction that's going to make people want to read your story because it's told them why is this important and how is my study going to answer some kind of knowledge gap in an important subject. Methods, like I said, very straightforward. What's the data source, design, outcomes of interest, predictors, analytic details. We did t-tests, we did ANOVAs, we did descriptive analytics. Results, again, very straightforward. Study characteristics, what were your outcomes? But the discussion is kind of where you get a chance to talk about why your study is so great. Um, because you did the study and it's great and you found this stuff and you get to talk about it. So I think a good way to format this, in the first paragraph, you just restate the key finding. Paragraph number one, in patients undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy, opioids are overprescribed with patients receiving, you know, seven times more than they actually use. Paragraph two is now adding some context to the finding. So you did some discovery, you've got this finding, you know, why is it important? Uh, maybe you talk about how the policy of opioid prescribing led us here. Maybe you talk about how direct to consumer marketing and Purdue Pharma is evil and has like totally, you know, ruined the opioid landscape in the United States, et cetera. Um, 
and so you're kind of adding context to why your study, you know, is important in the grand scheme of things. Paragraph, and that's kind of paragraph two to three. Paragraph three to four, what are the implications? So in my study, we might go on to say something like, you know, based on these findings, we think we could dramatically reduce prescribing and save, you know, millions of pills from entering the community, which is going to make patients and communities safer. Um, so maybe that's our next study. And then every discussion section has a limitation section. Um, and here you just be outright and honest about, you know, what your study addresses and what it doesn't. Our study, for example, is limited by the fact that it's a retrospective study. It's limited by the fact that um, it only looked at one surgery. It only looked at one institution, et cetera. Um, that's all fine. I mean, those studies still need to get done. Um, no one's going to look at that and be like, oh, they should have done a multi-institution study. That will come. Um, but, you know, just point out whatever the limitations are. And then conclusion, like I mentioned, restate your key finding and make a future looking implication. Um, so hopefully that was kind of a very broad overview with some tips that I hope are practical about how as a medical student, you can both <clears throat> actively conduct research and get things done and then be aware of the ways to share it with the world because that's how you're going to grow your CV. That's how someone's now going to come to you and say, um, oh my God, Val, you are like the national expert on, you know, creating these programs for medical students, like, please come speak at our institution, please come help us create, you know, some kind of pipeline program. Um, that's, I think, where you really start to get out as a name in a certain topic. Um, and I guess I would offer in summary, you know, productivity is a really important metric. Um, I don't think be overwhelmed by it, but just embrace it. It's the system, it's how people, you know, compare CVs and, and you know, rate people, but it's also how you get your interests out there and you get people listening to what you're interested and passionate about. Again, I'll emphasize it. Anytime you find yourself walking down the hall of the hospital and you're like, man, I can't believe that just happened or that's such a, you know, slow way or inefficient way to do something, you've just basically created a research project that you could publish about. Um, know where to send your research and hopefully we've covered that here. Um, and kind of at the end of the day, it's just like, do the work and tell the world. You know, if you come up with a well-scoped kind of self-sufficient research project that you're able to sit down and do the chart review, you'll get it done. And then you can write it up and you can tell the world about it. And I think that's, in the end, kind of how you make an impact as an academic surgeon and how you get people listening to you about whatever topic you're passionate about. Um, so thank you for letting me share all that. I wanted to make it as practical as possible. Um, and so I hope there were some tips that, you know, will help you guys in coming up with research projects. And I would love to have a discussion or answer any questions that you guys have. Brian, thank you so much. I like would look, so he sent me his slides a couple of days ago and like, he was like, no, we just kind of came out of research. And so we are all trying to like lay on a chair by a beach. He's like working in this lecture and then I'm like, Maybe I just should print the slides and start writing some notes since I now have to actually be productive. <laughs> um, I know Ryan has a meeting to get to, so I bet he would have a... But we can do so. I told him I'd be like 10, 15 okay. minutes. Okay, so we have so we a few minutes for questions so we can open, open it to the floor. Um, does anybody have any questions? Comments? Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have an idea, how do you, I guess, decide if it's like a novel idea or if it's even worth researching? Is it something you kind of just look up on PubMed? And if your idea is already kind of published, how far back, like if it was published maybe like seven, eight years ago, is it worth doing like an update or how far back can you do an update? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I, th I think it depends. There is, <clears throat> there can certainly be value in doing <clears throat> maybe a different version of something that's already been done. Um, you know, an example I'll give. So for example, the study I worked on looking at this aortoduodenal fistula, um, people have written tons of papers, like what's the mortality, what are the outcomes, et cetera. Um, but we wrote that paper too. And I think it was interesting because it was a rare disease process. And so people just wanted to see, is it different in different places? And so if you have a finding that is in line with previous studies, 
maybe you could make an art. So here's where, I, like, sorry. Um, so here's where you can get, I think, creative in how you kind of pitch your data. So let's say you have a finding that's identical to a study published 10 years ago. At first sight, you might say, like, why did I do that study? It added nothing. But maybe the pitch is like, wow, outcomes have not changed in 10 years. We have not gotten any better at doing this surgery in 10 years. Maybe you have a study that you repeat and it's vastly different than the study that was done 10 years ago. Now you're like, you've just opened Pandora's box of questions. Is it different because it's 10 years later? Is it different because our institution takes a different approach? Um, is it different because we studied a different population and maybe now we're realizing this disease in this population is what we should be looking at? And so I think, well, being novel is certainly helpful for sure. You know, thinking of things that are new questions that can offer new insights is, is great. You can, there's a lot of ways um, where you can do kind of a repeat study and, and come up with an interesting uh, argument about it. Um, I, um, in regards to like, like Robert, I'm um, in topics. So I, I've been doing my, uh, lit, my literature reading and I've come up with some possible topics that maybe tie in both my interest and my mentors, but, um, trying to look up more information specific to that. I've been struggling to find literature that actually embodies both. Um, so I'm really not sure how I could, um, tackle this in the sense of what I, um, how to actually get some reading done in terms of trying to tie in um, both ends, both buying interest and my mentors. Yeah, you know, depending on how rare or studied something is, it can be hard to find literature. I think a good practical tip is if you find, sometimes those topics have like a great key paper. You're like, wow, this is the one paper, it ties everything together looking at the reference list in that paper and looking at all 30 or 40 or 50 references because that paper is maybe the roadmap to all the different studies that inspired you know the one paper that kind of supports what you know you're interested in um i think searching pubmed i think searching google scholar i think sometimes frankly just searching google um maybe you know if you look outside of the academic searches you might find news articles that now lead you into stuff that you weren't aware of. You might find, you know, lay media coverage of certain topics that wouldn't come up if you did like a PubMed search or a Google Scholar search. So I think when you start something, it's okay to cast a really wide net um, to try to, you know, collect the things that are going to combine your interests. Um, this is a question both for me, but for like 2013 me trying to like do research. Um, when, what do you think is like an appropriate timeline for a project? Like, as you know, like as a student, you're like, oh yeah, I had like a month, uh, and then this fellowship is a month and we're like kind of structuring some of it to that, like is the beginning of our relationship, um, for the scholars and their mentors. But as one is trying to figure out like how fast should I be like getting this, getting it together before I like can enter some of the routes that you highlighted, um, like the, um, um, the uh, productivity route, that's what I mean. So like writing an abstract and then like writing a paper. And I think that sometimes when I was a student, I remember being like, oh, like am I taking too long? Am I not taking too little? And sometimes like the beat of the the rhythm of the dance is not set by your mentor 100 percent. like it would just disappear and they were like oh what yeah. about that paper and yeah. i like, never wrote it man <laughs> totally thought you weren't interested anymore so if you can comment on that i think that'd be helpful yeah that's a really good question you know um the first thing i'll say is one thing to remember is that <clears throat> you know it seems like you're going to be in med school forever right you're like oh my god i just became an m2 but the conference submission deadlines are for conferences that are like half a year away. And then it might take like six to 12 months for the journal to accept your paper, right? They review it, they do revisions, et cetera. So it can take, you know, over a year to get something actually published in a journal. And so with that in mind, you know, I think it's not to say like, oh yeah, just rush through and get the analysis done. But I think for example, 
you've got your idea. Let's say you need an IRB. Try to get the IRB written like in a day session. You're like, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write an IRB. Now you're waiting on the IRB approval, which maybe takes a month. You get your approval and then you do your chart review, depending on how big your study is. You're like, I'm going to go through a hundred patients. Maybe I'll do 30 patients a day. And so I guess I'm kind of like circuitously answering your question. I mean, I think if you can get results that you can turn into an abstract a few months after you conceive the project, I think it's still fresh in everyone's head. So Jessica and I did a project um, about um, AV fistulas, uh, where one of the faculty, transplant faculty was like, hey, we should look at opioid use after fistula repair because these are complicated patients. A lot of them have chronic pain conditions. Um, and I think if we had sat on that forever, you know, a year later, it just like wouldn't have been an interesting question, but it was an easy thing to address. And Jessica jumped on it. And I think within a month we had chart data for the patients and then we started doing surveys. So I think really, um, you know, if you can cut, I guess, you know, keep it fresh, try to get the data generated within the first month or two is probably good. It doesn't apply to everything. Any other questions, guys? Ryan, thank you so much. That was a fantastic lecture. I hope that yeah. uh, everybody enjoyed it. I know I was taking notes. Um, and I will, if that's okay with you, I will give them your contact information in case they have yeah. any additional questions on any of the things that you said or any of the resources that you mentioned. Yeah, feel free to reach out. Val can send you my email, phone, anything. I'm happy to chat um, and be a resource. I'm on research time now, so I've got a lot of time. And I have the okay. PowerPoint, um, so I will send you guys the power his slide. I'll send. I made some changes, so I'll send you the update. If you one. can send me the updated one, that'll be awesome. All, All right. right, guys. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. A lot. Yeah, of course, of course.